Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Wilfred Owen was a soldier poet of the First World War who wrote some of the most evocative, most well-known poems from the Western Front. Today I'm going to consider some of Wilfred's Owen, Wilfred Owen's letters um, from the front back home to his mother, Susan Owen, in Shropshire, describing some of the horrors of his experiences. So I'm going to read through and look at some extracts from Wilfred Owen's letters, along with providing a quick biography of Owen's military career uh, and also his progress into publication, so how his uh, poems came to be published, how they appeared in print, in order to consider how autobiographical elements of Wilfred Owen's um, Western Front experiences, his experiences of war, manifest in his poetry, particularly in the poem The Century. And to think about what Wilfred Owen considered his role as a war poet to be. Wilfred Edward Salter Owen was born in 1893. He enlisted into the army in October 1915 and after a year and a bit's training he arrived at the Western Front in the final days of December 1916 as a commissioned officer, a second lieutenant in the Manchester Regiment. In the next month, so in the second week of uh, January 1917, Owen led his platoon into the trenches. January 1917, incidentally, was part of a brutally harsh, brutally harsh winter, as indeed was the next winter too. And this contextualises, this kind of brutal coldness contextualises, I think, Owen's pervasive use of snow imagery within the poetry, but also, more importantly, the kind of sense in his poetry of a sort of natural bleakness and otherworldliness. Wilfred Owen evocatively describes the icy conditions within the trenches, for example, and the kind of experience of this for the soldiers in the opening line of his poem, Exposure, which was written uh, between December 1917 and September 1918. And the line reads, Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that knive us. What an amazing opening line to a poem. Our brains ache. You know sometimes that's exactly what it feels like when it's so, so, so cold. You just feel like your mind, your brain has frozen. Our brains ache in the merciless. You know, this is a place where there feels like there's no mercy. Iced east winds. Beautiful monosyllables there um, and the sibilance of the S sound. Iced east winds that knife us. You know it's being kind of attacked even even just by the weather. Wilfred Owen's military record shows the extraordinary, almost unimaginable, brutal combat uh, experiences that he and many others also had to endure. In mid-January 1917, for example, remember this is just a fortnight or so after he had arrived, Owen and his men were forced to hold a, a flooded dugout in no man's land whilst under heavy, uh, heavy artillery bombardment for two days. And Wilfred Owen wrote a heart-wrenching account of the event in a letter home to his mother, Susan Owen, on Tuesday the 16th of January 1917. My own sweet mother, I can see no excuse for deceiving you about these last four days. I have suffered seventh hell. Now this might be um, a kind of ironic reversal of the phrase seventh heaven. Seventh heaven is, a, is the, the most exalted uh, level 
of heaven, a state of supreme bliss. So it might be an ironic taste uh, take on that. I have suffered seventh hell rather than kind of enjoying seventh heaven. Um, it might also be a reference to Dante's Inferno, um, which is it's the uh, opening part of uh, Dante's 14th century epic poem, The Divine Comedy, uh, Inferno, i.e. hell. And the seventh circle of hell is violence, according to Dante. Um, so it might be playing on, on both of those. Oh, it might be playing on both of those there. I have not been at the front. I have been in front of it. I held an advanced post, that is, a dugout in the middle of no man's land. Uh, no man's land is the space between uh, the Allied and the German trenches. We had a march of over three miles. Uh, we had a march of three miles over shelled road, then nearly three miles along a flooded trench. After that, we came to where the trenches had been blown flat out and had to go over the top. It was, of course, dark, too dark and the ground was not mud, not sloppy mud, but an octopus of sucking clay. What a description. <laughs> the ground was not mud, not sloppy mud, but an octopus of sucking clay. Three, four and five feet deep, relieved only by craters full of water. Men have been known to drown in them. Many stuck in the mud and only got on by leaving their waders, their um, sort of long boots, equipment, and in some cases, their clothes. High explosives were dropping all round and machine guns spluttered every few minutes. And that's a very kind of evocative word, use of diction there in this um, letter by Owen, spluttered. Um, and he does that a lot in his poetry too. He uses these particularly sort of onomatopoeic descriptive words to, to describe the sound of all the, you know, bombardment that's going on around him um, and tries to kind of capture the different sounds that, that are almost ever present when you're there at the front. This kind of um, succession of sounds that are terrifying and that kind of bombard you um, hourly uh, or, or, you know, kind of constantly um, as well when it's going on. Um, there's, of course, eerie silence when, uh, when it isn't. Three quarters dead. I mean each of us. Three quarters dead. We reached the dugout and relieved the wretches therein. I then had to go forth and find another dugout for a still more advanced post where I left 18 bombers. That is, um, soldiers who throw bombs, not uh, bombers as in the kind of aeroplane bombers. I was responsible for other posts on the left, but there was a junior officer in charge. The, my dugout held 25 men tight packed. Water filled it to a depth of one or two feet, leaving, say, four feet of air. One entrance had been blown in and blocked. So far, the other remained. The Germans knew we were staying there and decided we shouldn't. Those 50 hours were the agony of my happy life. Every 10 minutes on Sunday afternoon, that was Sunday the 14th of January 1917, so two days previously, every 10 minutes on Sunday afternoon seemed an hour. I nearly broke down and let myself drown in the water that was now slowly rising over my knees. Towards six o'clock when I suppose you would be going to church. The shelling grew less intense and less accurate so that I was mercifully helped to do my duty and crawl, wade, climb and flounder over no man's land to visit my other post. 
It took me half an hour to move about 150 yards. And this language we see in Owen's poetry too, crawling, wading, climbing, floundering over no man's land. So this idea of floundering through mud we see, for example, in Dolce et Decorum Est, one of Owen's most most known poems, where in the sludge someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering. So going back to his letter, I was chiefly annoyed by my own machine guns from behind. This is annoy here in the military sense of to uh, to molest, injure, hurt or harm. That's from the Oxford English Dictionary. So friendly fire, uh, as it was called, and the term friendly fire was coined uh, in, in, uh, the, in the First World War for exactly this, being annoyed by your own... <laughs> By your own side. The seeing, seeing, seeing of the bullets reminded me of Mary's canary. So Mary is Mary Owen, who was Wilfred Owen's younger sister, younger by about two years. On the whole, I can support the canary better. And this sort of sound again, we can see that in his letters, Owen's very interested in the in kind of describing the aural environment that he's in. So the seeing, seeing, seeing of the bullets. As in his poetry, Wilfred Owen attempts to create the different sounds of the different weaponry. So in Anthem for Doomed Youth, for example, we have the stuttering rifles, rapid rattle, which is a kind of onomatopoeia. Um, and earlier, uh, I was talking about the um, a similar thing with the machine guns spluttered um, and here we've got stuttering so that kind of um, constant repetition is that you can imagine with uh, a kind of um, the rapid rattle of something kind of continually being fired and that's echoed here in stuttering rifles rapid rattle. In the platoon on my left the sentries over the dugout were blown to nothing. One of these poor fellows was my first servant whom I rejected. So in the First World War, every officer was assigned what was called a servant, uh, usually chosen by the officer from among his men. Um, And the servant was the kind of um, the officer's go-to assistant. So number two, sort of essentially. But one of the poor fellows was my first servant whom I rejected. If I had kept him, he would have lived, for servants don't do sentry duty. There's something so quietly sad, I think, about the the fact that Owen notes this, you know, that of course everything that's going on would be overwhelming, but the idea, there's a sense that in some way he feels responsible because he hadn't kept this poor person, this poor man, on as his servant and if he had he wouldn't be you know he he would not happen to have died in, in this moment if i had kept him he would have lived for servants don't do sentry duty i kept my own sentries halfway down the stairs during the more terrific bombardment in spite of this one lad was blown down and i am afraid blinded This was my only casualty. The officer on the left platoon has come out completely prostrated, so exhausted, defeated, and is in hospital. I am now as well, I suppose, as ever. I tell, I allow myself to tell you these things because I am never going back to this awful post. It is the worst the Manchesters have ever held and we are going back for a rest, which indeed they did. So in another letter to his mother, written a few days later, that Friday, so the 19th of January 1917, Wilfred Owen wrote, We are now a long way back in a ruined village, all huddled together in a farm. We all sleep in the same room where we eat and try to live. My bed 
is a hammock of rabbit wire stuck up beside a great hole, shell hole in the wall. Snow is deep about and melts through the gaping roof onto my blanket. We are wretched beyond my previous imagination, but safe. Wretched beyond my previous imagination. I, I just, I cannot imagine also how kind of overwhelming this experience must have been, but you know, but safe. That above everything is the priority, obviously. So returning to, uh, to the letter and also, of course, we have to remember he's writing these letters home to his mother and will be editing to some extent to try to reassure those at home as much as much as possible um, and finding some comfort perhaps in reporting that you know at the very least he is at least safe for now so returning to the earlier letter the one of the 16th of january uh, the one with the blinded sentry i hear that the officer who relieved me left his three lewis guns a lewis gun is a type of light machine gun uh, named after its inventor I hear that the officer who relieved me left his three Lewis guns behind when he came out. He only had 24 hours in. He will be court-martialed, that is. He'll be tried in a military court. And I think there's a bleakness in the kind of sparseness of the description here. You know, he left his three Lewis guns behind. He will be court-martialed. <laughs> you know that this man has probably lived hell for 24 hours and what is the reward that he is sort of officially given for spending this 24 hours in hell, in seventh hell? It's to be court-martialed because he left three of the guns behind. In conclusion, I must say that if there is any man, power, whom the soldiery execrate, that means kind of curse, abhor, uh, detest, more than another, it is that of our distinguished countrymen. So it's opaque here, but our distinguished countrymen, and there's an ironic tone, I think you can see too, to that phrase, our distinguished countrymen. It could be a reference to David Lloyd George, who was the um, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom uh, at the time and who was a Welshman. So by writing our countryman, Owen could be drawing on the Owen family's um, Welsh ancestry. So Owen's point then would be that the soldier's curse execrate the political establishment, the elite. Um, and this would have to be made obliquely because letters home from the front were very heavily censored. So you couldn't, you couldn't sort of specifically and clearly criticise uh, the, you know, policy or uh, any of the um, uh, commands, etc. that you were being given you couldn't make any overt criticism like that because they were being so heavily censored so you had to be a bit more circumspect about how you wrote your feelings um, back home so this allows Owen to be critical without actually you know but avoiding the censors um, and I think that this sentence comes after the he will be court-martialed um, speaks quite loudly um, because again as I said because the letter the, these letters were censored you you could put the sort of bald facts he was he will be court-martialed um, but but not any commentary about how you thought that was completely unfair etc so um, you have to sort of read between the lines of how Owen and other people who write letters home from the front, how they couch what they write to see how 
they're avoiding um, the censors, but trying to convey their criticisms, usually uh, at the same time. So I must say that if there is any power whom the soldiery execrate more than another, it is that of our distinguished countrymen who is, you know, in charge of an establishment that would court martial a person who went through seventh hell uh, because he left three guns behind. Your very own Wilfred. As I said, I want to think about the kind of autobiographical elements that find um, find their way into Wilfred Owen's poetry. So the events described in this letter were the inspiration, if you want to call it that, the... Um, uh, yeah, the inspiration for Wilfred Owen's poem, The Century, uh, which was first drafted later that year in August 1917. So that poem reads, We'd found an old Bosch dugout, Bosch meaning German. We'd found an old Bosch dugout and he knew. And in the letter um, w uh, Wilfred Owen had written, the Germans knew we were staying there and decided we shouldn't. And I think we can see that sentiment echoed here in uh, the century. And he knew and gave us hell, for shell on frantic shell hammered on top, but never quite burst through. Rain, guttering down in waterfalls of slime, kept slush waist high. And that's similar to the letter where they're standing in water um, and it's kind of rising up um, as they stand there. That riseth hour by hour, choked up the steps too thick with clay to climb. And in the letter, remember that really evocative phrase, the ground was not mud, not sloppy mud, but an octopus of sucking clay. And we have that a similar image here with um, too thick with clay to climb. This idea of the kind of sucking clay. What murk of air remained stank old and sour with fumes of whiz bangs. And again, we've got an onomatopoeic description of uh, weaponry, which was a, a phrase that was kind of common um, to the uh, men at the front, whiz bangs. Uh, and I think you can guess why they're called whiz bangs. The, the whiz is the sort of sound moving through the air, the whiz as it comes towards you, and then the bang when it actually lands, whiz bang. Um, the fumes of whiz bangs and the smell of men who'd lived their years and left their curse in the den, if not their dead corpses. There we herded from the blast of whiz bangs, but one found our door at last, buffeting eyes and breath, snuffing the candles, and thud, flump, thud, down the, ste down the steep steps came thumping and sploshing in the flood, deluging muck. The sentry's body, then his rifle, handles of an old Bosch bomb, and mud in ruck on ruck. We dredged him up for killed until he whined. Oh, sir, my eyes, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. Coaxing, I held a light flame against his lids and said if he could see the least blurred light he was not blind in time he'd get all right i can't he sobbed eyeballs huge bulged like squids and what an amazing um coinage huge bulged it's kind of ugly and gross sounding just the sound of those words together it's on you know the kind of onomatopoeic long u sound the u of huge and bulged uh, and the the g sound as well it's kind of bulbous it, it is it sounds like what it is um huge bulged you know these are kind of eyes that are 
bulging out of this poor man's head. Eyeballs, huge bulged like squids. I mean, remember in the letter we had the kind of octopus imagery of, of the sucking um, mud. And here we've got squids. Watch my dreams still. But I forgot him there, in posting next for duty, and sending a scout to beg a stretcher somewhere, and floundering about to other posts under the shrieking air. Again, we've got that word that reappears often in Owen, floundering. Those other wretches, how they bled and spewed, and one who would have drowned himself for good. And in Owen's letter, he writes, I nearly broke down and let myself drown in the water that was now slowly rising over my knees. You know, one, who is that one? And one who would have drowned himself for good. I try not to remember these things now. Let dread hark back for one word only. How half listening to that century's moans and jumps and the wild chattering of his broken teeth, renewed most horribly whenever crumps. And that's another onomatopoeic word for weaponry uh, and the sound, a kind of a crumping sounding <laughs> bomb. Um, so he's kind of haunted by this blinded sentryman, renewed most horribly whenever crumps pummeled the roof and slogged the air beneath. You know, so it's kind of these sounds bring back memories for Owen. Um, Through the dense din, I say, we heard him shout, I see your lights, but ours had long died out. And there's a kind of awful determination to be hopeful in this final line. I see your lights, but ours had long died out. The lights are out. He cannot, this poor blinded sentryman, he cannot see the light. The blinded sentryman just imagines that he might see the light. In March 1917, so a few months later, a couple of months later, Wilfred Owen fell through a shell hole into an underground bunker and was trapped there, semi-conscious, for three days. He wrote of the incident again in a letter back home to his mother, Susan, on the 18th of March 1917. I am in a hospital bed for the first time in life. After falling into that hole, which I believe was a cellar, a shell hole in the floor, laying open a deep cellar. I felt nothing more than a headache for three days and went up to the front in the usual way, or nearly the usual way, for I felt too weak to wrestle with the mud and sneaked along the top, snapping my fingers at a clumsy sniper. At another point, Owen was blown out of a trench and lay concussed, semi-conscious in a shell crater next to the dismembered, decomposing remains of one of his uh, fellows, one of his fellow officers. It was this episode uh, that was the particular catalyst for Wilfred Owen's bout of shell shock. Again, he wrote about the incident to his mother in somewhat sanitized fashion in a letter uh, of the next month so the 25th of april 1917 written from my cellar my own dear mother immediately after i sent my last letter more than a fortnight ago we were rushed up into the line so for the offensive on the 14th of april 1917 and the battalion's objective was a German trench called uh, the Dancor Trench uh, on some high ground north of the French city St. Quentin. So Owen writes, twice in one day we went over the top, gaining both our objectives. 
our A company led the attack and, of course, lost a certain number of men. I had some extraordinary escapes from shells and bullets. Fortunately, there was no bayonet work since the Hun, the Germans, ran before we got up to his trench. Bayonet work is as awful as I'm sure you can imagine it is. It's when you would attach a bayonet to the end of your gun and a bayonet is a sort of long, sharp um, sword attachment, essentially, and you would uh, stab people, make sure that they were dead. You will find mention of our fight in the communique. The place happens to be the very village, Fayette, which father named in his last letter. Never before has a battalion encountered such intense shelling as rained on us as we advanced in the open. The colonel sent round this message the next day. I was filled with admiration at the conduct of the battalion under the heavy shell fire. The leadership of officers was excellent and the conduct of the men beyond praise. The reward we got for all this was to remain in the line 12 days. For 12 days, I did not wash my face, nor take off my boots, nor sleep a deep sleep. For 12 days, we lay in holes where at any moment a shell might put us out. And it's beautifully understated, I think, that where at any moment a shell might put us out. A bit like a candle, you know, that you might you just put out a candle. But here it's the lives of these men, you know, so praised one minute by the colonel and just rewarded with 12 days of this, <laughs> of this seventh hell, 12 days of lying in holes where at any moment a shell might put us out. I think the worst incident was one night when we lay up against a railway embankment. A big shell lit on the top of the bank just two yards from my head. Before I awoke, I was blown in the air right away from the bank. I passed most of the following day days in a railway. Cutting in a dug, a hole just big enough to lie in and covered with corrugated iron. My brother officer of B Company, 2nd Lieutenant Gork Roger, lay opposite in a similar hole. But he was covered with earth and no relief will ever relieve him. Nor will his rest be a nine days rest. I think that the terribly long time we stayed unrelieved was unavoidable, yet it makes us feel bitterly towards those in England who might relieve us and will not. And again, it's a kind of a bleak kind of criticism that uh, Owen has to kind of resort to. As a result of all these um, terrifying experiences, in May 1917, Wilfred Owen was diagnosed as having a neurasthenia as it was called, neurasthenia, otherwise known as shell shock. Owen was evacuated back to Britain and in late June, on the 25th of June 1917, he arrived at Craig Lockhart War Hospital near Edinburgh in Scotland, which specialised in treating uh, mental health conditions. Craig Lockhart Hospital was really quite progressive in its treatments, uh, certainly for the time. And Wilfred Owen's doctor, Captain Arthur John Brock, encouraged him to write poetry as part of his treatment. It was sort of thought to be part of um, confronting and processing his traumatising experiences. Um, and as part of the, this also, um, Captain uh, Brock encouraged Owen to edit the hospital magazine, which was called The Hydra. And as editor of The Hydra magazine, Wilfred Owen took the opportunity to publish his first two poems into print. So this is Song of Songs, which was published in the issue of the 1st of September 1917, and The Next War, which was published in the issue of 29th of September 1917. 
And it was there at Craig Lockhart Hospital that Wilfred Owen met Siegfried Sassoon, that other great First World War poet who was already a published poet um, and a great, although sadly very short-lived, literary friendship was born. Both men had become disillusioned with the war itself, with the army's handling of it and with the propaganda as they saw it, the complete kind of divergence and disparity between what was actually going on at the front and with what was being reported um, back home. In a letter home to his mother, dated um, Friday the 19th of January 1917, which I mentioned earlier, which was written very shortly after Owen had arrived at the front, the people of England needn't hope. They must agitate, but they are not yet agitated even. Let them imagine 50 strong men trembling as with an ague for 50 hours. Dearer and stronger love than ever, W. But that was written only shortly after he arrived. He had had, Owen had had months and months and months of growing frustration at the difference between the way that people felt back at home um, and how they were kind of propagandised and what was going on at the front. And I think it's important to um, note here that Owen wants to kind of try and find ways for those at home to imagine how awful it must be because it was so odd and so otherworldly and so removed from everything. He's putting a very kind of particular uh, thought experiment or he's suggesting a very particular thought experiment for those back at home to try and hope that they will get agitated. Um, you know, that they will pressure the political powers that be uh, into stopping the war. Let them imagine 50 strong men trembling as with an ague for 50 hours. And it's not quite clear here whether they're supposed to imagine 50 strong men trembling for 50 hours or whether they are just supposed to imagine for 50 hours. Because if you just have to imagine... 50 strong men trembling for 50 hours and all you're doing is sitting in the comfort of your own home imagining this for 50 hours. Imagine how much worse that would be if you actually had to live that for 50 hours. Um, and, you know, and the times that Owen talks about when he's kind of in these craters, you know, 12 days on the line, two days in a crater, you seem completely unfathomable. Um, so just setting a kind of time period, perhaps, you know, go sit down and imagine what it would be like for 50 hours in the comfort of your own home. And then imagine how much that time period would be extended if, if it was really, if you were really, you know, if you were really a strong man trembling for all that time. So the older uh, Sassoon was a poetic inspiration and mentor for the younger Owen. And Sassoon's uh, handwritten annotations are evident on the manuscripts that we have of Owen's best known poems. So um, Sassoon annotated, for example, Anthem for Doomed Youth. Uh, and we also have Sassoon's annotations on um, Dolce et Decorum Est also. Sassoon would go on to help organise the publication of, and indeed to edit, the posthumous publication of Owen's poetry. So poems by Wilfred Owen was published in 1920. In November 1917, Owen returned to his regiment in Scarborough uh, in the county of Yorkshire, which is in the north of England, and undertook light duties. So he acted as mess secretary, for example, and this also is part of his rehabilitation. And this was a particularly productive period for Owen, um, poetically speaking. He revised several of his kind of previously composed poems uh, and also wrote several others. And in June, uh, such as the century, which I mentioned earlier, and then in June 1918, having been away from the front for a year, Wilfred Owen was declared fit for general service. He was recommended for a home posting, but it was rejected. And so... In August 1918, 
During the final advance on the German lines, Wilfred Owen found himself in France fighting once again. He was part of the successful breaking of the Hindenburg line in late September and early October 1918 and his courage and leadership in that conflict won him the military cross. And what do we make of this seeming contradiction? On the one hand we have a disillusioned, war-weary poet who can write so evocatively of the futility of war. But on the other, this same man can subsequently be awarded a military honour for fighting. Wilfred Owen himself, perhaps, can best explain this seeming paradox. So just after the successful offensive in which he won his military cross, on the 4th or 5th of October 1918, Owen wrote home again back to his mother Susan. I have been recommended for the military cross and have recommended every single NCO, that is non-commissioned officer, who was with me. My nerves are in perfect order. I came out in order to help these boys directly by leading them as well as an officer can. Indirectly by watching their sufferings that I may speak of them as well as a pleader can. I have done the first. So he's won his military cross for directly leading his boys as well as an officer can. And now in his poetry, he wants to help these boys indirectly by watching their sufferings so that he can speak of them, so that he can let the world know as well as a pleader can. Of whose blood lies yet crimson on my shoulder? where his head was, and where so lately yours was, I must not now write. It is all over for a long time. We are marching steadily back. Moreover, the war is nearing an end. Still Wilfred, and more than Wilfred. So, Wilfred Owen then saw it as part of his duty to watch the suffering on the front line so that he could document and report it and plead, plead on the boy's behalf that I may speak of them as well as a pleader can. You know, such an evocative word, pleader, you know, I'm pleading with you, um, you know, begging, um, it's sort of laying myself down in front of you. I'm pleading, pleading with you. So Owen wants to please and make an emotional kind of appeal to if you plead. But also, of course, plead is uh, what you do in a court case. You know, you plead your case. So it's got those two kind of meanings there. He wants to kind of um, be an official pleader, make a kind of official case for, plead a case for these boys. Um, as well as plead, as in beg, and um, <laughs> stir the emotions of the, um, the, the, the people back home. To be the advocate for his men, to plead their case, to let it be known how it really was, to expose the old lies of war, which are so very persistent. He had written of his poetic purpose in his drafted preface which was written in May 1918 before he returned to the front and it was for the collection of poems that he had been preparing for publication uh, and which as I said would eventually um, be published into print in 1920 with the help of Sassoon. So in that preface Wilfred Owen declared, my subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. All a poet can do today is warn. That is why the true poet 
must be truthful. A month after his letter to his mother, in the early morning on the 4th of November 1918, one week before the armistice, Wilfred Owen was shot and killed, attempting to lead his men across the Samba Ease Canal at Oars. The news of his death reached his family on the 11th of November 1918, Armistice Day, as the church bells were ringing. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature, then do subscribe. And if you have liked the video, then do please press the thumbs up button. It helps me out in YouTube's algorithm. Thank you to everybody who has supported my channel. It really is most appreciated. And what do you think of these letters by Wilfred Owen home to his mother? Do they help you understand his poetry better?